And that someone is uh, Irene Schneider. <laughs> I have in front of me a very uh, comprehensive CV. And again, I will just highlight a couple of points. Uh, Irene Schneider uh, lists as a specialty areas Islamic law, family, penal, and public law, law and society in contemporary Muslim so uh, countries, especially Morocco, Egypt, Palestine, which is your current area of research, I know, Iran and Afghanistan, uh, history of law, uh, the study of gender relations, these are central themes you have been working on. Um, Irene Schneider is a professor and has been since 2003 at the Seminar für Arabistik und Islamwissenschaft at the University of Göttingen. Um, her languages of work are Arabic and Persian. Uh, she um, is currently a fellow fellow. She's a fellow at the Kette Hamburger Institut yeah. Recht als Kultur, and we are all very, very pleased to have you as one of mm -hmm. us. Uh, she most recently spent time as a researcher at the Birzeit University in Palestine and at Hebrew University in uh, Israel. And uh, this experience and your observations certainly, I assume, will inspire some of what we will hear from you today? Nope. No, not quite. Okay. Today is about Iran. <laughs> um, right. Uh, your, hab uh, your habilitation is from the University of Cologne, where you have the Venia Legendi in Islamwissenschaft. Um, I see a, a long list of uh, Drittmittel, of research grants, and I see a long list of publications, five mo monographs, five edited volumes, and uh, somewhere around 50 articles. Um, the most recent book, maybe I will mention and leave it at that, if that's all right with you, is Women in the Islamic World from the Earliest Times to the Arab Spring, which was published this year by Princeton University Press. So um, welcome, it's wonderful to have you and we are very eager to hear your talk. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation to this colleague, which is uh, for me very uh, fascinating. I enjoy this day here. It's so much interesting and great, the atmosphere and inspiring. And uh, also I enjoyed uh, enjoy this conference. When um, Professor Gephardt asked me a few days ago whether I would be uh, ready to give this talk, um, I said yes, because I was ready to do it. But I must say it was also, uh, as for others, perhaps a kind of challenge uh, to deal with the concept of validity culture. So what I do uh, now is here to give some kind of empirical research and uh, perhaps first reflections uh, how we could connect it to this concept and perhaps we leave uh, it for the uh, discussion to go further. I will start with what is up um. yeah. I would uh, like to start uh, with a quotation from our little red book which we have in our, um, in, in our institute and our colleague which runs as follows. How can a normative commitment be created under the conditions of globalization and the rediscovery of religions in which the plurality of normative projections are linked together as an agreeable, multiple order without constructing a new uniform law of normativity or lending a validity to the particular special realms that would result in the dissolution of normativity itself, end of quote. So um, one place to look at, and I think this was also uh, the point where we stopped with the other talk before, uh, one place to look uh, for an answer uh, to this question, to the, this central question, is uh, I think international law, which claims universal validity. Even if looked at, for example, by Islamists as imposed by Western imperialist policy, it is itself the product of negotiations in the international community as represented in the UN. 
Influenced by a complex setting of legal, cultural, and here also religious concepts. These international legal instruments bearing these values now move or travel, some say, as some say, and become, by the way of the state's signature, part of national law. So this is what I, I want to look at. I want to look at the way in which international law is nationalized, is introduced into the legal context uh, of a certain state. And I quote Rissi and King, we had the King uh, this uh, day already, uh, from their book, The Power of Human Rights. They argue that um, the diffusion of international norms in the human rights area challenge norm-violating governments by creating a transnational structure pressuring such regimes. They call the process by which international norms are internalized and implemented domestically a process of socialization, which in the end leads, as, it would, uh, as I would take it from their paper, to more consistent behavior. The question of the adoption, implementation, or let's say very broadly, the arrival of international human rights conventions in different societies, states, and cultures is, however, as I would argue, a very complex process, which is not easily to be understood. So I will look at this process in my talk from an empirical point of view, taking as an example the discussion about the Women's Convention, you have it down there, CEDAW, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, um, 1979, uh, ratified in the UN, and how this is discussed in Iran. Um, I take and I concentrate on the arguments of two female scholars, Alaslan and Marla Wadi. I will just um, introduce them in a minute. Uh, I have to go quickly back to Risse and Siking because they also ask what the conditions are under which international norms are not socialized and the result thus in the stabilization of the status quo of norm violation. It is in this context that they mention the fact that international human rights norms, I quote, compete with other principal ideas, end of quote. But what are these principal ideas? I think here it's now where I'm going to make the connection to the concept of validity culture, which Professor Gebra presented. The concept of validity culture is, if I understand it correctly, we discussed it about this, uh, an ideal type focusing on, I quote again, we had it today, ethical and aesthetic styles through which the prescriptive character of a normative expectation can be derived, explained, made plausible and evident, end of quote. So validity culture is the way how norms and values are derived, are justified. And there are, we have this uh, tool, we discussed it, but I have it uh, once again here, uh, this big uh, two forms of religious and secular validity. Uh, I leave out here now uh, the, um, the third form of um, the extra, um, sorry, I just forgot the name, uh, which you, yeah, emerging state uh, form of validity, which you demonstrated taking the example of the First World War. But I'd like to concentrate on the first and second. Religious validity culture, as we said, is uh, which attains its normative power from the reference to holy text, holy orders, charismatic creators of law, a tendency to justify all positive laws by reference to holy law, and secular validity culture, which is characterized by drawing its normative power from references to profane texts, worldly actors, and so on. Um, you also state that typical consequences follow from these. Uh, and you say it's flexibility, agility, predictability, adaptability, binding force, force du droit, potential to lend identity, etc. So uh, I don't know whether I understood you right that this is correct only for one, for the secular, or the religious, or for both. I'll try just to uh, now to think about how it adapts to the Islamic version. Um, Anyway, there seems to be a, um, a big difference, and uh, you stated this different times between religious and secular uh, validity, uh, validity culture. Um, I just uh, have a short, well, want to have a short note here 
uh, Islamic law has, of course, often been called a holy law, uh, example given by Max Weber, as you know very well. And this has been connected to certain implications, not only with Max Weber, but also in the following discussions. Uh, so there was seen a basic difference, and I think you repeated this today too, uh, to the so-called profane rights normally, and this is what you did not say, but sometimes it was said, and assumed immutability because of the holy law, it's based on holy text, and so it cannot be changed. Uh, these are some of the arguments, and according to Weber, uh, being an obstacle for the rationalization of the legal order. This is how he dealt with uh, Islamic law. Um, so what seems central uh, again is this distinction made, and I now would like to look uh, how this is uh, I can uh, find or how I can uh, yes find this reflected or not reflected in my empirical work. Um, yes, but uh, one more word. Um, taking the Islamic law as a holy law is, of course, based on the assumption that this law is based on, first of all, the Quran, as you all know, the, the holy text, which is normally God's own word for the Muslims. And uh, in the second place, the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, that means the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad. I just uh, told uh, to Professor Zabersberg that we could connect this very neatly taking uh, um, um, one argument that this is a memorial narrativity, of course, because uh, norms are derived from Muhammad, from his acting, his saying, and so on, and they're used until today as a normative. Uh, as normative. Uh, so, uh, according to the definition above, we could expect that all arguments used and text referred to, uh, referred to in an Islamic uh, state uh, are holy texts. Um, but we, as I say, I will uh, have a look at uh, this discourse in the Islamic Republic. My methodology is just discourse analysis with a special focus on terminology because I, uh, I want to argue that it's not only necessary to look at arguments but even to go one step deeper and to look at uh, the terms used. And I'd like to uh, find out what does it mean for consequences like disability and so on. So, I will uh, see which set of arguments are used, what are the reference texts in this discourse, and what are the typical consequences. Short, very short introduction to the field. Uh, Iran and the US are among the few states in the world which have not so far ratified CEDAW. <coughs> uh, even the majority of uh, the Islamic states has ratified CEDAW, albeit most often with reservations, sometimes uh, these reservations are with uh, regard to the Islamic Sharia, which is the so-called Sharia presumption. CEDAW actually was once accepted by the Iranian parliament, but it was rejected by the Council of Guardians. Now, the Council of Guardians is, uh, is an organ. Uh, you could perhaps compare it very roughly to a constitutional court. Uh, but this is not a good comparison. But it's an organ which controls whether laws having passed the parliament are Islamic, whatever Islamic means. So now I'm uh, going to uh, introduce my protagonist of the discourse. This is Fariba al uh, She is uh, a Shiite religious authority in Iran. She holds a PhD in women's issues and is professor at <coughs> Zahra University, and actually in Jose, which is a Shiite form of university in, uh, in Rome. She has published a book in 2004 in which she examines Sidao in detail and in which she rejects it as absolutely un Islamic. Do you remember my field research in Iran between October and December 2008? I had an interview with her. Um, she, which was not easy to get, <laughs> she is a very difficult uh, person who does not give interviews freely. Uh, and she was in January 2014 appointed as a member of the High Council of Cultural Revolution and therefore now in the new government has a uh, quite important <coughs> political position. The other uh, uh, woman is Shahin Doch Maula Radi. She is a jurist and for a long time she was head of international affairs at the center of women's participation. 
In this position, she was active and pushed for ratification of CEDAW. Uh, albeit with reservations, she would have uh, argued without reservation there would be no ratification. Uh, I used several of her published and unpublished uh, articles, the unpublished articles, because in some of these articles she makes her arguments much clearer uh, for now, uh, so I could use it now very easily. So now what set of arguments I used? Um, there are certain keywords, or let's say principled ideas, or let's say core values around which this discussion evolves. And these are first gender inequality, the second is feminism, the third Islam, Islamic jurisprudence, FEC, and the last one is uh, strategical arguments uh, for signature or ratification of CEDA. I start with the inequality uh, argument, and here they have to focus on the terms. Uh, we have two terms which become important in this context. The first is uh, tasari, in Arabic tasawi, it would be in Persian, it's the same, it's from taken from the Arabic, which if you would take a dictionary, open the dictionary and look it up, would just mean equality. And uh, the second is tashabu, uh, which would mean similarity. Um, now the whole discourse on gender in the Islamic Republic of Islam uh, of Iran is very much based on um, on these two terms, and this is because it they were introduced by this man Ayatollah Murtaza Mutahari. He died 1979, so you see he died in the year when the Islamic Republic was established. Still, he was very influential for the discourse in, in uh, the Islamic Republic. He wrote. Um, a book uh, called The System of Women's Rights in Islam, Nizamur Bukhazanda Islam. And this uh, is a basic, um, let's say, uh, argument with, or better, polemic against the United, uh, the Human Rights Declaration uh, of the United Nations of 1948. Now, what does he say in this book? He says, Islam is for equality, Tasawi, Persian Tasawi in Arabic, but it is against similarity. So uh, the problem is to understand what he means uh, by this, and I cannot go into detail here, but to make it very short, uh, tashabah for him is a very negative uh, term. It is uh, sometimes something like in German gleichmacherei, however you would translate this into English, I don't know. Uh, it is very negative. Uh, it's something to make everything equal, which is not equal and should not be made equal. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, as I said, equality is very positive. But this concept of equality, tasavi, for example, means uh, that polyandry is not accepted, but polygyny, which you have in Islamic law, is accepted. The, uh, the argument is uh, that um, polygyny, uh, poly Andri is against human nature, not against the Quran, it's against human nature, and polygyny is acceptable. So uh, this concept of uh, equality has to be in your minds when we now start to look at Aluswan's and Maulavadi's discussion. Because Aluswan now says, uh, referring to him, uh, that Tashabo can similarity cannot be accepted at all. Her reasoning is quite interesting. It's not uh, pointing to Quran. She does point to the Quran too. But first of all, it's biologically and psychologically. Uh, because there are biological and psychological differences between the sexes that cannot be denied. And these, of course, lead to different rights in the, in the uh, society. She says this is confirmed by the Quran. First of all, it's a biological argument. Um, the right to practice polygamy, uh, poly, uh, uni, of course, uh, to be exact, is also anchored in Iranian national legislation. Oh, oh sorry, I missed that one. She confirms this in the Quran, pointing to the Quranic verse, which allows polygamy, and then also points to the Iranian national, national legislation, which allows this too. Now, Alusand is well aware that her gender concept runs counter to several articles of CEDAW, Article 1 and Article 16 of, uh, um, at least, uh, 
the Article 16, for example, grants men and women equal rights in marriage, which is of course not true if you have the possibility for a man to have four wives, but not for a woman to have four husbands. Now her argument is, because Islam accepts equality, tasabi, but what is in the convention is surely not an Islamic equality, she concludes that the concept of gender relation in the convention must be tashabah, must be similarity. Now, um, naturally, you don't find the word similarity in the, uh, in the convention. And uh, there is also no official Persian translation of the text. There is only an official Arabic translation, uh, which uses the word tasawila, it's Arabic, in Article 1 and 16, and also the word muzawad, which is taken from the same Arabic root. It is magda and muzawad by Nagarul wal Marad, means the principle of equality between man and woman. <coughs> Sorry. She argues, however, that Tashabo is present in the introduction in articles, she quotes 10 and 11, it's difficult to see. One has to uh, be aware that she really reads the term Tashabo into the convention. And uh, just again to make it uh, clear, she bends the terminology. What, if you look it up in the dictionary, if you take the normal use, if you take the use of the word in the convention, Tasavi would be equality, and for her it's Tashawa which would be used. So um, this is um, the argument um, which I wanted to make, or a bit uh, to make uh, for, that we should also look at this level of, um, of the terminology the discussion uh, how its terms are connected to concepts. We had uh, uh, today also the hint that there is a translation of the term and the translation into a, contra, a culture, cultural context has to take into consideration this, um, uh, this aspect as I think. Now Mala Ladi, the other one, she now sh tries to show that uh, Tashabo is not the spirit of the convention. She maintains that the goal of the convention is equality, and she argues that uh, equality with respect to civil rights, political, cultural, social, and economic rights are given and are necessary despite the natural and biological differences. Uh, she also argues that countries arguing in favor of cultural relativity should be aware of that cultural differences cannot or may not hinder the acceptance of the international minimum standard of human rights and gender equality belongs to these minimum standards, she argues. So the convention does not deny biological differences. She tries to show this uh, point to Article 12. 12, for example, because there is uh, a reference made to pregnancy and to lactation, uh, but it is for equality. Second, feminism. Very um, hot uh, debated uh, because uh, Alice Wand, uh, and she stands for a lot of people, of course, a group, of course, uh, say, says that feminists argue that biological and psychological difference should not influence the order of the family. Now, this is very rough. She, is, she goes a little bit more into detail. She knows uh, the concept of gender and the construction of gender and so on. Uh, but uh, I make it short here. Her argument here is uh, feminism gives priority to freedom and honor of women as individuals rather than to their social duties, family obligations, and obligations for the country. Her main point of critic, critic can be seen in the concept of in this concept of individualism. Uh, the individual independence, independent personality uh, of women, uh, which has priority. This is what she uh, criticizes. She says uh, feminism is opposed to the institution of family and other social institutions. Um, of course, it's connected to the other co uh, uh, argument with the difference, biological, uh, difference in biological uh, state of men and women and then consequences uh, of different rights. So women are the bearers of the children. Um, Maradadi, on the other hand, argues, and this is very nice, that even authoritarian feminism, as she calls it, with really strict, westernized uh, feminists, would never argue in favor of similarity. 
uh, but uh, she would again say that, human, uh, that men and women are human beings, their reputation, their dignity and human rights have to be officially uh, recognized. Now I come to the next <coughs> set of arguments, Islam and Islamic jurisprudence, fair. Um, Aluswant points to the general incompatibility between the Islamic <coughs> gender concept and the convention. She says that we, if we would sign the, the convention and we need a <coughs> state, we would be standing between the convention and the religion. She ignores the developments in modern legislation and even in the Iranian civil codes or feminist interpretation and just uh, refers to the Quran and the uh, verse, for example, 4.3, in which a uh, man is allowed to take two, three, or four uh, women or wives. Maulavadi, on the other hand, uh, says true Islam is completely in agreement with the standards of the international human rights. Uh, and she says, and I think this is an interesting um, argument, I quote, if there seems to be sometimes a conflict, one should cast doubt on the reading of Islam or the understanding of human rights, end of quote. Unlike Alaswan, she quotes exegetical uh, developments. Uh, for example, she quotes the Egyptian feminist Qasim Amin, who had a modern interpretation of uh, um, female rights. Muhammad Abdu, who was an Egyptian uh, of the 19th, 20th century and was uh, voting for modernization of the law. So, so her main argument is in line with modernist thinking, and she says it explicitly, that in the area of rituals, people have to stick to the text, but not in the area of relations between human beings. It means not in the area of law. She also quotes uh, Khatami, the former president of the Islamic Republic, according to whom fiqh, that means Islamic jurisprudence, has to be avant-garde, pishtas, and that the developments in the Iranian society and in the world need to be taken into account. Now I'll come to the last uh, set of arguments, strategically, and make it short. Uh, Aruswant, of course, wants to uh, say that Iran should never ever sign uh, or ratify it. Uh, her arguments are that Iran is already criticized for gender discriminating laws, so this will not become better uh, when it ratifies you know. uh, uh, Then she says, it's true, the world needs the voice of Islam, but this cannot be, uh, must be done from this position, but can be done from another place. And uh, with regard to national legislation, she confirms that there are laws in Iran which are, according to CEDAW, discriminating, but this is Islamic, according to her definition. And the Constitution of Iran pays special attention to topics concerning women. The last in, uh, argument is quite interesting here. Um, the Convention and Gender Equality, she argues, are not yet binding international custom, a use Cohen's point of view. That's it. So Iran should, uh, should uh, together with other Muslim states, develop an Islamic Charter for women's rights. Uh, Maula Wadi, on the other hand, says public national welfare. And this is an Arabic Persian maslahat, um, which is a very traditional uh, term, too, as a governmental guideline makes it necessary to sign Sita. She refers to Khomeini, the founder of the Islamic Republic, and argues that the Islamic government has even the right <coughs> to suspend the religious duty of pilgrimage, which is a basic duty, one of the five pillars of this Islam, in the case the public welfare is in danger. This is a real case which happened, I have forgotten to look up in which year it happened. <coughs> there was a problem with Shi'i pilgrims coming to the, to the Hajj in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, because uh, the relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran uh, were not that good. So uh, Iran was afraid that uh, clashes would happen, and uh, so Ira Khomeini forbade the Hajj, the pilgrimage, to Mecca, which is one of the main religious duties. And this is what she says here, uh, this can happen, and in this case, uh, the welfare of the state has to be at the first position. Um, and she also says, of course, it's, it's like other Islamic countries have signed CEDAW, Iran is in danger of isolation on an international level, um, and should ratify. So now the conclusions. We had uh, the question which arguments are used, and what are the typical consequences. Uh, now I'm uh, getting a little bit, um, yes, not so clear because I think we should now start the discussion. 
uh, first a few words, of course, I had, as you saw, Alus Wand develops a whole counter model to the convention's concept of gender role and gender uh, equality. Um, based on a different gender model, but Maula Wadi sees no problem to combine modern Islamic interpretation of Quran with the principal ideas of uh, the convention. Um, what we experience here is the discourse, and of course the two scholars only represent much larger groups in Iraq and also in other countries, is the reflection of an inner Iranian or is even um, broader in the Muslim world discourse of different gender models and the question of the right uh, interpretation of Islam is either compatible or incompatible with human rights and gender equality. But uh, as I try to show also, it's a question of terminology and concepts. Now let's have a look at the arguments. I mean, we have the argument equality. Both scholars used biologistic. Can you say it in English, biologistic, biologistic arguments? I think so, yes. Uh, so taking the biology as, as reference right, frame. And um, from this follows according to one, uh, different from according to the other, uh, equal rights. Um, I just want to remind you that the same arguments uh, were used in 19th century <coughs> Europe. It was, for example, stated that men have a more heavier brain than women, and from this results that they are, of course, more intelligent, men being rational, women being emotional, and you know, and all this was at that time considered to be scientific because the brains were heavier. So uh, the same argument uh, is, can also be a, a scientific argument of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of this gender uh, difference. Feminism is criticized because it's against families. So this is quite a clear a social argument, taking um, what is often said, uh, the family as the basis of the society and not the individual. And, uh, seeing this as a very high uh, value of the country. With regard to religion and tech, of course, Alison states the general incompatibility, but as we see, uh, saw, Maula Wadi states the different, the completely opposite. Uh, and both refer to, uh, to, um, to the text, and to the, text of, uh, the interpretation of the text. And finally, the strategic arguments are, of course, political. Iran should or should not ratify. So if we take, uh, take a look at the texts which are used, the main text first of all discussed is the Sirao text. Both uh, scholars go into detail, try to discuss much more than I could show this here, the articles and the implication of these articles and the meaning. Then the references made to international law, also to Iranian law. Of course the Quran is also quoted, I would not deny this. Um, but then for example also modern Muslim or Islamic interpretations are quoted. Uh, I mentioned uh, Muhammad Abdul Qasim Amin and so on. So we could see that the consequences from this uh, are a high flexibility, the possibility to have very opposite positions taken out of the same text. This is, of course, the result of hermeneutical of hermeneutics of the texts, and uh, of course, a potential to lend identity. So now, just some reflections, which are not very uh, well structured. Uh, if we look at this discourse, we can state, yes, a frame of reference is religious. Reference is made to Quran and to Sunnah, but also to other texts. So we cannot deny that we have a religious validity culture in the sense that, I quote, uh, the prescriptive character of a normative expe uh, expectation is derived, explained, and made plausible by reference to the holy law, end of quote. But it is also a secular, or let's uh, say profane, but I think it's also difficult because Dr. Um, use it, a profane validity culture in the sense that the arguments are biologistic, are social, are tactical, are political, and so on. The whole discourse is, of course, embedded in the cultural, social, legal setting of a modern nation state, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now you might say, okay, this is a modern discourse. It uh, came about by, uh, by colonial powers. By the way, Iran was never a colony, but anyway. Uh, no, um, Baba Johansen has shown in his work, and especially in his famous article, the Sündige Gesunde Amme, 
that even Hanafi jurists of the Middle Ages um, were clearly aware that profane arguments had to be taken into account sometimes at the expense of religious arguments. So what I just explained to the Hajj, he showed it for a text of the 13th and 14th century too, looking at the, um, at the discourse, the real discourse. Furthermore, we should not forget that Iran is of course a special case. It is, as it calls itself, and it is uh, in the constitution rooted, an Islamic republic. Uh, Leon Buskens has, for example, shown for Morocco that uh, the reference frame is completely different. Whereas I would say it's correct that in Iran, on a political level, uh, taking into, um, yeah, refer referring to CEDAW is not possible. This is very well possible, for example, in Morocco, uh, which is a completely uh, different uh, legal culture. Um, and again, of course, uh, that uh, both scholars uh, which argue in this religious reference frame come to completely different uh, opposite uh, result. So um, my question would be, but this could also be um, because I don't understand the concept really, what, what makes the heuristic value of an ideal type which so neatly separates religion and secular validity culture? Uh, for my topic, uh, I think it would make more sense to look at the values or the principal ideas which are negotiated and how they are negotiated exactly. So we have this kind of gender inequality, uh, individualism, culture, family, uh, and so on. And uh, to look at the way how these are uh, discussed uh, to also be able to do it um, Kulturübergreifend, uh, could this be? Transcending cultures? Yes, transcending culture. Um, and my, uh, I would also opt or vote for uh, looking very uh, basically at the terminology used and how uh, these values are uh, discussed. So, as I told you, uh, this is very difficult for me, as it's, uh, it's the state uh, of my reflection, uh, and uh, I'm now open for discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much for you.